All right, now we're recording. Okay. All right, so 5.2, 5.1 was going over the structure of the membrane, right? 5.2 is, is going a little more detail about this idea of selective permeability. So selective means you don't let everything through, like you're choosy. Permeability is letting something through or not through. Um, so selective permeability, basically the cell doesn't, the cell doesn't want to let everything in, or maybe it wants to let some things out. And maybe what it what it wants to let in or what, what it want to let what it wants to let out will change just depending on what's going on with the cell at that time. So maybe you eat a big meal and like you want to bring in some of that sugar that you just ate, but like your cells don't want to be greedy. They don't want to take in too much sugar. So they're going to maybe like change at some point, they're going to block off what's bringing in the sugar. Okay. Um, anyways, let me get my clicker over here. Okay. Now, um, what determines whether something can go through the cell membrane is hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So remember hydrophobic, you're afraid of water, like a phobia. So if you're hydrophobic, if you're some sort of molecule that's hydrophobic or nonpolar, those are the molecules that can come across the cell membrane easily. Why would that make sense? That the hydrophobic things can get across the cell membrane, but if you're hydrophilic, or you love water, you have to have some something to like, some sort of protein to help you get across the cell membrane. What about the cell membrane makes it uh, um, select for the hydrophobic things? Yeah, Kenneth? Does the inside of the membrane is higher than the outside? Yeah, the inside part of the cell membrane, those fatty acid tails, those are going to prevent, um, like, let me get it. Let me get us a picture of our cell membrane here. Uh, right here. So these tails here, these fatty acid tails, those are hydrophobic. So if I want to be able to get all the way through the cell membrane, I got to have, um, I got to be a nonpolar molecule. If I'm, if I'm a molecule that's hydrophilic or polar, um, like say water, I'm going to need some sort of protein channel to let me get through. So let's say this solute, let's say this is water. So this is water. Water would need a protein channel to help the water come through. What was the, what was the name for the, the protein channel that brought water through? I remember? Antigone, go ahead. Aquaporin, Aquaporin right. The uh, like agua, Spanish for water, the aquaporin will let water go through. Now, um, they, these channels are specific for a certain solute, right? Meaning this, this protein channel doesn't just let, it only lets water, and it's not going to let water and sugar and other things in. Um, so yeah, there you go. Let me go back to uh, that first slide. All right, so yeah, so we're going to be um, choosing what goes through or doesn't go through. Something polar like sugar, that's going to be something that would need one of those channels. Okay. Um, now, technically, some of these molecules can move through really slowly. So water can technically get into uh, the cell without a protein channel, but it happens so slowly that life wouldn't be able to, the chemical reactions for life wouldn't be able to happen fast enough. So that's why we need to have those uh, those protein channels and stuff to to speed up that process of letting things in or even like waste trying to get that out of the cell. Okay. Um, all right. Then you also can have transport proteins. Um, so that would be that would, that would be like a channel protein, like the aquaporin. Here's a structure of the aquaporin. It's kind of a lot going on here, but like this would be like here's your cell membrane. All right here's the inside of the cell outside not anything for you to like know necessarily but you can see the water molecules being able to go through the uh the aquaporin channel now i have a question for you going back to like polar and non-polar amino acids where would you expect like like if i looked at this portion of the uh of the aquaporin would that be made up of a uh, polar or non-polar amino acids Okay, what you say? Non-polar, non good, why? Um, yeah, yeah, because if you're going to be a protein on the inside of the cell membrane, the outer portion of that protein, it pictures like a cylinder, like a Pringles can or something, the outer portion is going to be non-polar, 
But then um, if you look at the very inner portion, like the interior of that cylinder, that's going to be polar. Why? Why would the inside of the protein be polar? I think of like a Pringles can or something like the inner or like if I hold this up, like this is the channel. The outer portion is made of the non-polar amino acids, but the inner portion is going to be made of the polar amino acids. Why would that be so? No? Yeah, because you're letting polar water go through. So if you're non-polar, you're not any more helpful than the cell membrane about letting water come through. Okay, so you gotta you gotta picture these proteins three dimensionally. The the outer surface of it would be non-polar, but then the inner channel part that the water actually would come in contact with, that is polar because it's interacting with the water directly. Okay, um, so then yeah, we have some other transport proteins that will um, that will shuttle things across the cell membrane. Let me get back to that picture from earlier. So this would be a carrier protein that can bring things across the cell membrane. So you could have a channel, like just like literally like an open door, or you could have something that's like um, basically it's closed. It's like a like a turnstile when you're like going through um like a ticketing gate, you know what I'm talking about? Like where you push it and it turns to let you enter. Like, um, uh, what are those doors called? Like that, like uh, the revolving doors, you know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like that where this solute, say this is sugar, would bind. So this binding site here, it is specific for this specific solute. So if this is sugar, if you had some other sugar, it would have its own carrier protein that recognizes its structure specifically. So it binds like a lock and a key, binds in there, and then that will change the, the conformation. It'll like swing that revolving door around, letting, and then spitting out that solute inside the cell or outside, depending on what you need to do. Okay. All right. Going back. Around here. I think that does it for 5.2. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, 5.2 is pretty short. So, 5.3 is getting into this idea of diffusion. So, diffusion is called passive transport. So, um, if you think of somebody who's really passive, you probably think of someone who just kind of like sits there and like doesn't do anything, doesn't use energy, right? It's very inactive. We'll learn about active transport um, in a couple of class periods, but passive transport is transport that doesn't require energy. So diffusion is an example of that. Um, think of diffusion like this. If I were to like spray Febreze from like back here, eventually that Febreze would get to the other end of the classroom. That's diffusion. In diffusion, things want to go from more to less. So diffusion, think more less. Okay. And um, yeah, so they want to spread out to the available space. So if I back to that, like Febreze example, like I spray it, there's more molecules here that's going to spread out. So there's less molecules, um, you know, the other part of the room. And um, each individual molecule is moving randomly. It's not so much that like any one Febreze molecule has eyes and a nervous system and is like that part of the classroom going over there. They're just moving around randomly and they want to spread out because they're bumping into each other like bumper cars. And then slowly they just keep bumping into each other less and less and less as they spread out. Okay. Um, and then dynamic equilibrium. Let me show you a good picture of diffusion happening. So um, like here, Here's a, like, this is showing a membrane here. This could be like your cell membrane. And um, so they're at higher concentration here, more here, here they're showing like dye. So here's some molecules of dye. They're going to bump into one another. And so by bumping in, they're naturally going to want to, like, as they ricochet off each other, they naturally spread throughout that container. And then you get to this position where you get at equilibrium. Now, what are they trying to show by showing an air like these two arrows? What does that mean? It's a really like com like common misconception with diffusion and equilibrium. Manual. Yeah, right. So equilibrium just means you have the same concentration on both sides, right? 
on both sides, we have eight, I think, yeah, eight of those uh, yellow orange balls or whatever on both sides, but any one specific orange ball can keep switching spots, meaning this one or this one here will move across to here, but then this one will take its spot. Okay, so equilibrium doesn't mean things stop moving. It's just that they keep moving, but like the, the overall, the net change doesn't, the net change on both sides is the same. Okay. Um, now getting into diffusion of two solutes. So for two solutes, so if I have two different colored balls now, um, there's something called a concentration gradient. And uh, a concentration gradient is just talking about this idea that things want to go from more to less. This would be a concentration gradient right here, more to less. But each um, solute has its own concentration gradient. Um, so concentration gradient for each solute. Meaning when you have like the, the orange dye and the, the purple dye, they don't care about one another. They only diffuse away from each other. So like here, these orange ones are going to keep moving across until you get the same number on both sides, as will the purple ones so until they are the same on both sides. They don't care about the movement of one another. Now think to an actual cell membrane, okay? Why would each solute have its own concentration gradient? Why would, why would like think of these as like two different kinds of sugar why would they each move independent of one another? And let me show you this picture again as like a hint. So looking at this picture, why would each solute have its own concentration gradient? They, each one moves from more to less based on its own, it does its own thing. Or think of those like the child toys, like the blocks, like the square block going through and then you have like the round block goes to the round hole if that helps each solute has its own concentration gradient why and so you, you know well for carrier protein at least they're specific to certain type of like molecules so yeah even if it wants to go more or less it's yeah exactly oh and and to be sure the um the channel protein is also specific okay. to um maybe a little less specific than a carrier protein but this is, they're usually, cause it's a, it's a, like a shape of a protein. It's going to be more specific for um, its own solute too. So all surrounding that cell membrane are different kinds of protein channels and carriers that are specific to a, to a solute. That's why they go down their own concentration gradient. Like if I go back to this picture here, um, it would be like each hole is only specific for like the red ball or the purple ball. That's kind of what they're not showing there. Okay. And then, yeah, you get the equilibrium where they're not stationary. They're just moving back and forth at the same rate. Okay. Um, and yeah, so each thing goes down its own concentration gradient, more concentrated to less, more to less. Um, and then again, we call that passive transport because I don't have to use energy to make that happen. It just happens. All right, now um, a type of diffusion, if it's diffusion when we're talking about water, that's osmosis. Like Osmosis Jones, anybody? Got any Osmosis Jones fans out there? I've never seen it, but apparently it's this like animated movie with this like water-based action figure thing. Um, I don't know if that helps you remember it because osmosis is just specific to water. It's not talking about like also the movement of sugar or something. So water always wants to go from where there's more water, more free water, I should say. So I'll add that in, more free water to where there's less free water. Or where there's more, water wants to go from where there's more water that's like, there's, it, let me show you a picture here. Water wants to go from where there's, um, so you look at this picture here. There's more water that's just hanging out and free. Water wants to go from here to where there's more space for the water. Or in other words, water wants to go from where there's less solute to where there's more solute. 
So water goes from um, right over here. Water moves from less solute, less solute, that's not how you spell that, less solute to more solute. So that's water. The reason water goes from less solute to more solute is because of this. Looking at this picture, sugar is polar. A lot of your solutes are these polar molecules where water on this side of the membrane and this side is representing the right-hand part. This side represents the left-hand part. And this would be your dialysis tubing. This is what's happening in your dialysis bags, okay? Over here, the water is attracted. It's more attracted to the sugar molecules than it is to itself. And so when it does that, Look at all of this free space right here that is not occupied by water. Whereas on the left side where there's less solute, there's just more water just being all crowded around each other. So the water wants to go from where there's more water to where there's less water. That makes sense? So over here, this would be, right, this is higher concentration of solute. This is lower concentration of solute. So that's why the water concentration, the amount of water goes up on the other side. Um, when you go to like Sonic, I mean, I'm Sonic, you don't know Sonic. What a shame, there's not a Sonic around this area. You go, to a, you go through a drive-through and you say easy on the ice. Why do, you, why, does, why do people say that? Why would you say easy on the ice? You want more drink than ice. So what you're telling me is that ice takes up space in your container, right? So over here, it seems like there's the same amount of water, but because there's more solute over here, this is like having more ice in your drink. It's taking up more space. The volume is the same, but the, the solute is taking up more space. Whereas over here, you still have the same amount of solute because it can't cross, but now it goes up more because you're getting the same concentration of water on that side. Okay. All right. Um, another word I need to introduce um, is uh, going over what's called tonicity. So this is kind of an application of this uh, idea of osmosis. So tonicity is um, if I put a cell in some sort of solution, will that cell gain or lose water? And um, then you have isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic. These words are adjectives. Isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic. Meaning um, they can be applied to like, this says isotonic solution. You could also say the cell is isotonic. And this is, what, this is what I want you to think of when you hear these words. Really, I want you to remember one word. If you remember this one idea, everything else will, will fall from it. Um, you know how like you're hanging out with your friends and you guys just drink a ton of water and you get really, really hyper. You're hyper for because of the water hyper for water happens all the time right you're hi i'm being serious i you know if you study biology in college you'll you'll take this class and then you'll probably take freshman bio and like you take all these biology classes and they show you this concept again and you'll always forget what is hypertonic what's hypotonic just remember hypertonic you're hyper for water and then everything comes from there so let me show you what i'm talking about let me give you an actual example so I put a cell in a hypertonic solution. A hypertonic solution, what do you think that means about the solution? What is it hyper for? Water, right? So that's why the water leaves the cell. The solution is hyper for that water. So the cell is going to shrivel. But this is where it gets tricky because a hypertonic solution means you are, means the cell is hypo, that's not gonna work, made it. That means this cell, let's do black. A hypertonic solution is a hypotonic cell. Those hypotonic, hyper, those are adjectives. So the cell is hypotonic. Think of a hippo. As we all know, a hippo is really big and stuff because it, it, it like already has a lot of water. It's already full of water, right? This cell was full of water. It was like a hippo, but then it was in a hypertonic solution that was hyper for water. That's why it lost all its water. 
Okay. Now, isotonic, everything's normal. The concentration of water in the solution versus in the cell is the same. So there's no net movement of water. Um, now, hypotonic solution, it's the opposite scenario. A hypotonic solution, that means the cell is hypertonic. This is a hypertonic cell. So now the cell is hyper for water. So that's why the water goes in the cell. And if too much water goes in your cells, they explode. There was this uh, challenge back when people watch, like listen to radio shows, like back in my day, and there was this competition called Hold Your Wii for a Nintendo Wii. And um, they basically had people drink a bunch of water and hold their Wii for a Nintendo Wii. <laughs> and um, it's really funny, but something really, uh, really awful happened. Um, a woman actually died from drinking too much water. Yeah, it's awful. What, what happened? What do you think happened? She drank too much water and she ended up dying. So what was going on there? Yeah. So she had too much water in her bloodstream. So then the solution, her bloodstream was hypotonic and her cells were hypertonic. And so too, many, too much water is flowing into her cells. And they were, uh, by lice, that means burst. In French, lice, I'm just kidding. <laughs> In German, lice means purse. I don't, I don't know. It, that's just what's happening at first. Um, and then shriveled is when it's, in the, it's a hypotonic cell. I hope that's making sense. I, I promise you, you think hyper for water, everything else flows from there. You can just reason from there. That is literally my exact thought process when I do these problems. Yeah. Was it like too much water or not? Uh, both, right? Um, yeah, because... Uh, there are certain animals like um, later in five point three. There are certain like um, uh, protists that like they'll live in water and they'll have what's called a contractile vacuole that can pump out all the water that keeps flowing in. Because if you're in a lake, like there's all this water surrounding you, so you want to pump that water. Oh, mistakes. Mistakes. Okay, everyone's down. Um. Anyways, uh, looking at a plant cell. So um, if you're a plant cell and if you put a, a hypertonic plant cell in a hypotonic solution, the plant is hyper for water, right? So the water is going to flow. Yeah. Oh, green. Oh. Green. If I see her, she comes in, I'll sit down. Okay, great. Um, okay, so if it's a plant cell, the plant cell won't explode. Why is that? Why would the plant cell not explode? Come here. Um, well, that's the water will get stored in the central vacuole, but that isn't so much why it won't explode. Although I guess it would help to have that other membrane in there. Uh, Brandon? The cell wall, yeah. So because plants have a cell wall, they won't explode. So actually plants want to be in a hypotonic solution because um, turgid, that means strong, I think. Um, if you're nice and turgid, you're nice and strong, I guess. Uh, so a, a turgid plant cell, because plants don't have like a skeleton and stuff, they need to, they need to have some way to help give themselves some strength Having being in a turgid state that will help give it some structure. Uh, yeah, good. So, what happened with the, um, the plants that you had? Yeah, oh, the, the succulents that I yeah. smothered to death. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's a, I know what can happen with some plants is um, they don't, like, if they don't bring in the water enough, like, they don't, because, like, like a, like a cactus type plant, like, they, conserve their water so so well that like if it is keeping bathed in water for too long somehow that kills them i don't really know exactly why it's just bad i know like fungi can start growing and that's a bad thing but i don't think that's what, what killed them um i don't know i have to do some investigating to figure that out um anyways so if uh how could so if you look at a plant and it, its leaves are all shriveled that's a sign that plant needs water, right? The, the, the leaves start drooping. So that's when the plant is flaccid. 
right? Flaccid is lint. In Italian, flaccid means lint, probably, right? Um, flaccid means limp, so like the lead, like it's now not as full. So it's kind of weird. So isotonic is flaccid. Now, if you put in a hypertonic solution where it's losing all of its, um, it's starting to lose too much water, then it gets plasmalized, where the cell membrane, it can't shrivel because of the cell wall, but the cell membrane like shrinks in on itself. Why would that be a bad thing for a plant cell? For like it to shrink in on itself. Why is that such a big deal? To like lose all that cytoplasm and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I would have to imagine that just starts breaking things. And if you break random things, that's probably a bad idea. Um, it would affect like the rate of chemical reactions and stuff. So if you add too much water or too little uh, water in a cell, that changes the rate of chemical reactions in a cell. Right, and we want chemical reactions to happen at a very specific rate to sustain life. Okay, uh, is there any questions on this? The uh, the quizzes and, and mastering biology is really helpful for um, letting you see some practice problems because they'll give you a lot of these scenarios. Like a cell is placed in a thirty five percent solute concentration, and the cell is fifteen percent. Which direction will water move? Like they'll make up problems like that. Um, so I'll let you do some practice with like looking at the mastering bio or the quizzes for that, but that's the basic idea. Just think hyper for water. Okay. I'll stop the recording.